Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the next keynote talk here at the Web Conference 2021. Uh, my name is Alias Kushmarl. I am an, a researcher here at the Josef Stefan Institute in Ljubljana, uh, and I'm the local organizing committee co-chair for the conference. Um, so it's turning out to be a nice sunny day in Ljubljana, and while unfortunately we can't share the sunshine with you, I hope you're enjoying the great presentations and talks that we've been able to collect to your many submissions. Uh, so, it's uh, my pleasure to announce the next keynote speaker, uh, Professor Elena Simperl, who will be giving the talk titled The Web of Data, How Are We Doing So Far? So, presenting Elena's achievements could be a talk in itself, so I'll just touch on some of the highlights. Uh, she is a professor of computer science at King's College London. She is a fellow of the British Computer Society and a former Turing Fellow. Um, her research focuses uh, mostly on the intersection between AI and crowd computing, uh, so designing systems that combine machine algorithms with uh, human uh, and social capabilities. Um, and so she's authored hundreds of publications, contributed to more than 20 projects, uh, and worked mostly on topics such as knowledge engineering, semantic technologies, open and linked data, social computing, and so on, so on and so forth. Um, so she's a very active member of the scientific community. So she served as a, a chair of several large conferences, such as the European and International Semantic Web Conference, the AAAI Conference of, of, on Human Computing and uh, Crowdsourcing, um, and the European Data Forum. And uh, she also leads many summer schools across Europe, Asia, and the US. Um, and well, that's actually how I first met Elena, uh, as one of the teachers at the European Semantic Web Conference uh, School in uh, Crete, uh, where she and the others were introducing us to the world of semantic data in the small Greek village. Uh, and from there and our later work together on projects, I know her to be a very clear and no-nonsense uh, uh, speaker on any topic, so I'm very <laughs> interested in what she has to say on the progress of the, of the web of data. So uh, with that out of the way, Elena, please take it away. Thank you. Um, thank you for this introduction. Um, I would like to point out perhaps from the very beginning that the opposite of no nonsense is not necessarily making sense, but let's just hope for the best. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, the web conference is um, one of the handful of events I try to attend every year. I'm really happy to join you today, even virtually. Just a bit of context about myself um, on top of um, what was said in the introduction. I've been part of the web community in several ways. So by training, I belong to the semantic web or the web of data crowd hence the subject of my talk today. However, I've always approached the subject from a human-centric perspective. And in time, I've also joined the social web crowd. And that has impacted on the type of research I do and the methods I use. So my talk today asks the following question. How far did we get in delivering the web of data? I think this is an important conversation to have for at least two reasons. Number one, it has been 15 years since the idea was first put forward by Sir Tim Berners-Lee. There's been a lot of investment, a lot of research, a lot of development into it. So 15 years down the line, it's worth stepping back and reflecting about what went well and what didn't. Second, compared to 2006, data has become even more important. Many of our latest technological advances depend on access to data. Governments legislate how data should be governed. We are becoming increasingly aware of the limitations of our data collection, labeling and reporting practices with consequences for the algorithms that use such data. How does the web play into these important conversations? Well, I'm glad to say that I'm not alone in this ambition to review and reflect and several esteemed colleagues have published rather eloquent accounts of related topics recently. So in February, um, we had a review of the semantic web field by Pascal Hitzler in the communication of the ACM. In March, Claudio Gutierrez and Juan Sequeda discussed knowledge graphs 
in the same outlet. Here I am now in April talking about the web of data. My feeling is that my take on the subject will be slightly different um, because of the socio-technical lens I use to study the subject. But nevertheless, I'd very much encourage you to um, have a look at both articles for a more complete view. We were told on Monday in the opening that this is the 30th web conference. So this is an incredible achievement. And all this time, the web has shaped directly or indirectly our understanding and our interactions with data. And there's various ways to think about this. We use web tools like search engines to answer factual data centric questions like here, the one um, about mayors of London. We use shared folders in the cloud. We use GitHub and other tools to share data with others and collaborate. Scientists, government, cultural heritage institutions, they set up entire web portals for their own data. This data can in turn be used by other parties, be that people or machines, in many contexts. There is huge amounts of user-generated data available online. We've heard about user-generated data, I believe, in one of the keynotes at this conference already. There's geodata, like here on the slide with the open street map. There's ratings, there's reviews, there's structured knowledge bases like Wikidata and many others. We leave digital traces in apps, on websites, in social networks, and this is the data that keeps large parts of the web alive by feeding established business models with varying consequences. And our opening keynote spoke about some of these consequences from a legal point of view. Those who have access to data like that are at an advantage when developing and using AI. And in that context, a lot of progress in AI is also due to us having access to web services to label the data conveniently. These labels are produced via various forms of crowdsourcing. And the example here on the slide is from uh, Digital Humanities, from a project called The Old Weather, where citizen scientists online help um, humanists transcribe weather observations recorded in historical logs. All this data, some openly available, some shared only with trusted parties, some licensed to third parties, possibly for a fee, were supposed to feed into a global web of data. And the idea was that this web of data would basically bring together these heterogeneous resources, just like it connects web documents. The main components of the solution were modeled after the web itself. We're talking identifiers, we're talking links, we're talking metadata, we're talking shared vocabularies, we're talking mechanisms to read and write data, and so on. The web of data is in that respect very much related to another web, the semantic web. Ultimately, both of them subscribe to that vision of making meaning explicit or machine readable so as to facilitate the sort of digital products and services that would make our lives better. The web of data addresses a specific part of that vision, that of integrating across different data sites. It has never claimed it would remove intentional data silos, but it hoped to help at least avoid unintentional ones. Some people have questioned the feasibility of the concept. I don't. I think there are examples in many domains, in life sciences, in digital humanities, in government, that already went well beyond showing feasibility. The question that I'm asking in this talk is, how far did we get? And is it sustainable? My answer in short is as follows. There is a lot of data on the web. Some of this data is arguably more webby than other. There aren't many links between data sets, but publishers do make an increasing effort to provide metadata of reasonable quality. The idea that the web of data is only about linked data technologies or even about linked open data needs to go away for good. Instead, I think we can and we should iterate. We can also learn from experiences that we have made over the past 15 years with this particular technology stack, with related standards, to understand what worked and what didn't. This may mean going back to the um, underlying architecture and question whether the web could ever do for data 
what it does for other digital resources and services. Because I personally think the analogy is not universally helpful. Data has become much more important today than it was in 2006. The reasons why people put data online, the reasons why people interact with data on the web, have distinct characteristics which go beyond searching for information or browsing for information in a global graph. I also think iterating over the idea is a question of people, of organizations, of business models, laws and practices. Um, the brilliant Jenny Tennyson from the Open Data Institute thinks we are at a crossroad in data availability, which I believe she called recently our data reformation moment. And I subscribe to this vision completely. I'm on the one side quite excited about it because I think we're now in a much better position to deliver on the idea than ever before. We have a critical mass of data online. We know a lot about different stakeholders and their needs and expectations. But there are also perils ahead. 15 years down the line, with many other priorities and interests at play, we might lose the web of data we have with massive consequences. So that's my take on a subject. Now let's look at some of these elements in greater detail. Just like the web stands for many things, services and platforms and search and retail and social networks, the web of data is equally diverse. And I'm talking here about the web of data in practice rather than in theory. The theory, some of us might know, was a technology centric concept, which came with a certain way to publish resources online and access them using W3C standards, such as the resource description framework, RDF or RDF schema, Sparkle and so on. So we've come a long way since the first linked open data cloud a uh, picture here on, on the left, was published. That was in 2007, and it had 12 data sets. Um, as of more or less a year ago, that cloud had expanded to as many as 1,255 data sets, with something more than 16,000 links between them. Some people argue this is a great result. I would very much disagree especially as progress over the past years has slowed down. And you can see that in the graph on the right hand side. There has been a lot of discussion in the research community, in the developer community um, around um, making linked data more useful in real world applications, about decentralized architectures to access and manage this data more effectively, about the role of Sparkle, which is a native query language, um, and the W3C standard, um, about how to combine um, web APIs with linked data, including various papers published at this conference, which I found very interesting. However, I personally think there's two further issues which are interrelated, which some of this research doesn't really address. And the first is the business case for creating and maintaining links. Links are one, if not the magic ingredient of the web, um, but they're not heavily used um, in um, the web of data. The other is the costs associated with using linked data as a technology stack versus its benefits compared to other technologies and the evidence we have, or in fact don't, of these costs and benefits to take decisions. I'm going to give you an example from government. This is a domain that tends to be very linked data friendly, at least in Europe. I've been working with open government data for almost 10 years now, um, especially in a capacity as scientific advisor of a large European investment into open government data. That is the so-called European data portal. The idea of this project is to provide uniform access to government data portals in many countries, not just the EU. Um, and that's work that is done in the context of uh, relevant legislation, which is called the Public Sector Information Directive, now actually it's called the Open Data Directive. Uh, this was published as early as 2003, I believe, and then updated most recently in 2019. So the idea is that we have a network of distributed data providers, all with their own legislation and local data strategies and priorities, and the European Data Portal harvests metadata about them, more than 80 such data sites, adding up to over 1.3 million data sets in 36 countries. As a data consumer or user, you can do data set search 
for instance, via the search box um, over here at the top, or using facets, um, for instance, agriculture, economy and finance, health, and uh, so on. You could also do more on the portal. In fact, you can learn about how the data is used. Um, you can um, learn how others have reviewed data. You can train yourself in, in, in using open data and publishing it. As a publisher, you have access to tools and methods to improve the quality of your metadata that you're using to describe the data sets and learn about how to go about understanding how the data is used and about its impact. My main contribution to this effort, and there's lots of people contributing to it, my main contribution has been to think about how to make data publishing efforts more sustainable. And to do that, we've carried out observational studies which I will mention in a bit. We've written recommendations and guidance for publishers. We've trained government data providers and so on and so forth. So today I'm going to talk about two studies we've done in the European Data Portal, um, which we published at um, the International Semantic Web Conference two years ago. They were based on a corpus of over 1 million data sets that are indexed by the EDP, which use DCAT, a particular type of vocabulary, to describe the data, so to create the metadata. The first study looked at the adoption of linked data um, in e-government. The second study focused on the quality of the linked metadata, which accompanies these data sets. And the message is loud and clear. I don't know if you can see it on the on the uh, slide at the top. There is a table that says total data sets 6,636 uh, out of a million. Adoption of linked data in government doesn't happen. And that is despite tens of millions of euros in investment at European level, even more investment at national and local levels. The technology is still not widely used. So when given a choice, public authorities don't use it. Some of them do, like you see, perhaps you can see here on the second table, parts of Spain, parts of Greece. In the linked open data cloud um, in the latest version, um, I have a small screenshot here on the right hand side of the slide. There's a few others. So there are the Italians and the Spanish um, that, that we have found, um, but also some parts of Greece and I think Slovakia. Um, so there is, there are some pockets of adoption, but compared to the entire corpus, over a million data sets, it's extremely, extremely niche. Even when that happens, there are issues. For example, one of the biggest issues we have found is that the vocabularies that are used in these data sets are not dereferenceable. Some elements of the linked data approach seem indeed to be more useful or more used than others. And I'm talking about identifiers, I'm talking about metadata vocabularies. In fact, we see these elements in use not just on the open web, but also by industry in their own internal projects. Um, and that's, I believe, also discussed in the two review papers from CACM, which I mentioned at the beginning. The second study was about metadata quality. The outcome was actually better than we thought. Um, so there is room for improvement, but um, most providers do make an effort um, and the quality does improve in time. However, reusing someone else's vocabulary is a distant dream with very few exceptions. We found thousands of proprietary vocabularies, sometimes within the same national legislation. And as I said, non-dereferenceable, which is a principle of linked data. On a related note, those of you interested in this sort of studies, um, the um, screenshot here is from a blog post of the Google dataset search team. They've done an analysis of their corpus, which I think was very interesting. So what do we make of these results? Well, government publishers publish data because there is a law that mandates it. This is, this is an oversimplified way to look at it, uh, but just bear with me. So there is a law that tells publishers to do it. In this context, what is really the case for making one's data schema easy to reuse by others? What do the users of these data sets really need? Do they need a shared vocabulary? Is integration across a number of different data sites a huge priority? And if not, why would anyone want to spend time creating and managing links? So what I'm doing here is I'm not contesting some domains use linked data much more than government. 
And I do believe it is a useful approach, but it is not the only one. In fact, here's a very different example, just for contrast. This is a linked data success story from cultural heritage. Europeana, some of you might have heard about it, integrates content in different modalities with metadata published as linked open data. But the context is very different. There is a joint data model. There's data sharing agreement in place between Europeana and individual data providers. There are also concerns about provenance and authority of the information of the metadata and about what identifies to use and why. The user journey is very much centered on people looking for information about a particular cultural heritage topic and being able to hop from one piece of content to the other across different collections to learn more. For data providers, the promise is that using linked data, and in fact, using linked open data, will generate more traffic to their collection. I'm not questioning the argument, but I do wonder about the cost-benefit analysis and how it looks like compared to other technologies for integration. This would be really a very interesting study to see, and if anyone knows about it, do put that information in the chat. I'll come back to this over and over again in the talk. There may be areas where strong local champions advocate for the benefits of a particular technology, but in many other areas, or as time goes by, we will need evidence to support decisions and document impact. One of the central questions in my web of data research is to find practical, scalable ways to collect and analyze such evidence. Now, let's go back to linked data. Linked data is used in some parts of the web, as we have seen, not in others. Regulation and investment don't always push the needle in the right direction. When there isn't a clear business case for integration, none of these mechanisms seem to necessarily help. How about the rest of the web? Well, it turns out, <coughs> excuse me, the web is full of data sets. And I mentioned Google data sets search before. Uh, this is a tool they have launched a few years ago, and I believe there was also a paper at this conference in 2019 that talked about it. As of last summer, it claimed access to 25 million datasets. These are dataset resources described using DCAT, the vocabulary I mentioned before, or schema.org. Now, 25 million is already much better than 1,200 but it's still only a subset. And when thinking about the web of data, I tend to take an even broader view. For me, the web of data is the sparsely linked graph of web tables embedded in web documents, online data sets in various formats, like we have seen in the previous examples, or even charts actually presenting data in accessible ways. Some of these have identifiers. Some could have identifiers. Some have metadata records associated with them or semantic markup. Some, like charts, have absolutely nothing yet. So let's just take as an example the Web Data Commons. This is a project supported, among others, by the team at Mannheim led by Chris Pizza, who is, by the way, one of the authors of the original Link Data paper. It's a great initiative that publish, publishes many interesting data sets, corpora of web data, including most recently, I think, um, yeah, it's here on the slide, a 4.2 million collection of relational tables that use schema org markup. For me, that sort of work is super interesting for at least two reasons. First, it shows again that people do use shared vocabularies, unlike what we have seen in government to describe things when it actually matters to them. It also gives me as a user centric researcher an idea of the sort of data that publishes that people think useful enough to justify that effort of annotating it. And maybe you can see it here in this uh, table on the right hand side, that seems to be people, products and local businesses. I'd be very interested to see a study on the use of, say, CSV on the web as well, which is or a corpus of CSV on the web tables. This is a standard which acknowledges the fact that people use CSV to publish data rather than other formats and encourages them to describe those CSV in a consistent way. The aim is to discover business cases that would make me, as a data publisher, big or small, um, annotate my public shared Google spreadsheet from the earlier example so that I can reach my goals faster. Perhaps my goal is indeed being indexed by search engines, but perhaps I want to sell the data 
and that that's not something I want to talk about today. Perhaps there are more elusive reasons like transparency and accountability or in open data, the sort of, um, of um, lofty ideals like supporting data reuse for arbitrary application contexts. It is almost impossible in most cases for a publisher to be able to show that those reasons are actually met without huge effort. And that's the sort of research um, I've been trying to do. Ultimately, I do think this has to do with sustainability. Because while some people will argue we don't have enough data available on the web for others to use, I argue, as I said earlier, that we're at this crucial moment where soon we might have even less useful data on the web over the next years if we don't work on making these efforts sustainable. The verticals I mentioned earlier are probably more likely to deliver on these cost benefits conversations that data, data publishers have all the time. Because publishing data costs time, it costs money, it costs resources, it costs reputation. But we do need to have those conversations for other verticals as well, rather than pushing for a particular set of technological choices. And this brings us to a related question. If we want to see how far we are with the web of data, we need to ask from those millions of data sets, how much are they actually used? And the sad answer is that we don't really know. Do we want to know? We do, I think, for several reasons. First, publishers need to justify investment and prioritize. Otherwise, at some point, the money will dry out. New publishers need to decide whether they set up their own site or use an existing one and what the implications are. In fact, every time I talk to a potentially new publisher now, and in 2021, these are not country level initiatives with huge backup, but small to medium sized uh, cities or regions with local champions, they all tell me the same thing. Oh, we've seen this portal and we've seen this initiative and it looks really good, but we really want to make sure our data is used. Consumers need also to be reassured about data quality. This is important because people use the web to discover data that they need for their work, for their studies. And they need to be able to say if the data is relevant, if the data is trustworthy, if it is easy to reuse in practice. Use and impact are definitely related, but not the same. But understanding use is a step to thinking about and monitoring impact. And in both cases, we just don't have that much information, methodologies, evidence um, to make real progress. Part of the scarcity, it's worth saying, is actually due to how publishing happens or happened. The focus was, and actually still remains, at least in this community, on the publisher, perhaps also on the developers with the design of APIs, but not on what we call the end user. And I've tried to change that. And one of the first pieces of work I've done with Joanna Walker and others at Southampton um, on behalf of the European Commission was to give guidance for data repositories about user-centric design. This was a paper from 2017 published by the European Commission um, where we proposed 10 principles. You can see them listed here on the slide. I won't go through them all, but they range basically from organizing your content for the use of data sets to promoting use to discoverability, collocation of tools, collocation of documentation, and so on. Such principles may be useful, but ultimately it is super hard to apply them when a new portal is designed or an existing portal. And for this reason, we try to operationalize them. Say so we use the uh, tested approach with, uh, with a stepwise scheme, like in Five Star Link Data Publishing or in the Open Data Certificates designed by the Open Data Institute. And we studied a lot of literature for each of these 10 principles and defined the five levels for each of them as guidance. So there are some examples here, uh, just very quickly, for organize for use uh, rather than publishing, we range from um, having metadata to previews of data sets to recommendations, reviews, links. Um, for promoting for use, the focus is very much around activities to build a community of users, to publish use cases, to train, for collocate documentation, and that's my last example. This is really about placing information about the data sets in close proximity to the data itself. 
We then assessed 10 portals along these 10 dimensions. The sample we chose was meant to be diverse in terms of maturity of publication effort. The European Data Portal um, does a yearly assessment of open data maturity. That's not something I'm involved in. It is work led by colleagues at Capgemini in the Netherlands. Um, so we had a ranking of, data, of, of countries um, and initiatives, and we picked from across the spectrum. We wanted this sort of diversity because the aim was not to have an actual ranking, but to understand practices and identify systemic issues. To control for software capabilities, we only choose portals that use a particular type of software, in this, in this um, uh, case, CCAN. And the results were super interesting. Everyone scored low on discoverability. So capabilities to make their data sets uh, rank higher in search engines. Everyone scored low on collocating documentation, for instance, as well. The other thing that we have established, which we sort of knew from before, was that current software architectures don't seem to make it easy to implement something like promote for use at all. And there was a follow-up study, which I'm not going to have time to go into today, where we looked at how we could automate such assessments, which for these 10 portals we've done manually. The principle be measurable, which is one of the 10 principles in the framework, remains universally challenging for this reason. As a next step, we then moved away from data repositories to other places on the web where publishing and sharing of data does happen. With the same sort of user-centric questions in mind, we wanted to see how we can link principles to make data easier to use to evidence. There's a lot of data sharing that happens in the cloud, with the web being simply the means to access the data remotely. Think about shared folders, think about GitHub, think about Kaggle, all web places where people do work on data together. Now, if you're a data publisher, or perhaps a new data publisher, there is a lot of guidance out there, including FAIR and many others, about how to release your data in a way on any of these media for potential reuse. We've done a joint work with Paul Gross's team at Amsterdam, where we try to address two issues. First, there's a lot of guidance. Is there a way to organize it? Second, where's the evidence that any of that guidance works? Just to give you an example, according to Paul, there's around 140 or so recommendations on fairsharing.org. Let's just say I'm a historian from the old weather project, creating a data set labeled by citizen scientists. Where do I actually start when it comes to the question of releasing my data set to encourage reuse? Our answers are in a paper published recently in the Patterns Journal, data set reuse towards translating principles to practice. Um, this is exactly what, we tried, what, we, what we've tried to do. So we first looked at the literature, there were around 40 papers, and I think almost as many potential reuse vectors for data sets. And there are some examples here. Uh, so there's connections between data sets, there's provenance and versioning, there's way to access, there's a lot about documentation, including methodological um, choices and quality. So there is literature that says that you have to do all these different things to make your data easier to use by others. Then we try to operationalize the guidance, like in the previous study, and we've used GitHub as a case study for data publishing and sharing. And we had access to a corpus of 1.4 million datasets that were published on GitHub uh, by 65,000 parties. We looked at those uh, recommendations from the literature. Many of them did indeed translate in characteristics of the data. For instance, it's schema, the format it is published, documentation, features that we can actually observe on GitHub. There are also other features of datasets like size and, and age, which we can observe on the platform, file distributions. Um, and then we try to link these sort of features to proxies for data user views, which were basically engagement metrics available on GitHub. And we've trained the model, because it, it was 2020, we've trained a machine learning model to predict what parts of the publishing leads to higher engagement values. In this way, we were able to actually collect evidence on the impact of some of those principles from earlier. For instance, collocate documentation, pools um, on engagement of users with the data sets. The predictions of the model were not great, uh, could be better, but the focus was 
really not on, on, on the machine learning side, but on the methodology to give data publishers a way to think about measuring use, to give them some signal as to what matters and some evidence that after you've published 26,000 data sets, it really does make a difference to have good documentation and to have good metadata. We've looked a lot at publishers of data so far. So we know what data is out there. We told people how to publish the data better uh, in a user-centric way. And we've also encouraged them and showed them how they could collect empirical evidence about how others use the data. What we haven't done is really looked at the users themselves. So people look for data online. This may mean wanting to know the mayors of London, but it might also mean looking for a data set to write a report. For instance, here, school assessment outcomes and higher education degrees. So we've done, in the last five years, we've done several studies in data set retrieval on the web to understand search behavior. And one of these studies was done in 2018. We had access to logs um, with 2.2 million queries over four different data sites. And we've established two types of search personas. One that starts on a web looking for information, the other one starting directly on one of those data sites. In both cases, the queries were short and included location and temporal information. We've done a more extended study, two parts, of logs of the European data portal for the European Commission. So we're talking about 800,000 or so sessions um, over three years, web search as well as native search on the portal. Um, on um, this meta site that indexes 80 different data sites. We looked again at queries, but we also looked at collecting evidence for some of those user-centric principles from earlier to say whether, say, collocating documentation really leads to more traffic as demonstrated uh, by the logs. So there were some, um, some highlights, <coughs> excuse me, um, again, we could see that the information needs of people starting their search in a web search engine and on the portal are very, very different. Um, a propensity for spa spatial and temporal information in the queries. We've also established how important result presentation is, in particular data previews. Um, showing people how the data is used, for instance, by creating data stories or use cases also really seem to matter. There's one thing here on the slide about more logs needed because I hope personally we will be able to make such logs available more widely for the research community to use. I also hope other publishers will do the same in other domains, not just government, so that we can advance the field. Given the importance of result presentation, we've done a lot of research into human data interaction, in particular how results are presented um, and into data documentation. If you're interested, this month we've published um, a summary of all the research in ACM Interactions. It's called the UX of data, making data available to make it usable. Um, this is based on a whole range of study. In one of them, um, we looked at result presentation. So we've heard from the log analysis that previews matter. And we wanted to look at different ways you could render these previews. Um, one typical way is to show perhaps the first rows in um, and, and, and the schema. The other um, type which we have focused on are text snippets, which are used in some portals extensively, but, but, but not in all. So in the study, we've asked people to write hundreds of hundred word summaries about data sets they did not know before. And the summaries were meant to present the data for others to use. So instead of you having to download the data set and spend time cleaning it and so on, such a summary would give you more confidence to, to, to follow through. And we've identified clear common themes, which these summaries would need to touch upon information that people need when deciding whether to use a data set that is published online. We'd like for future work to use this sort of information to potentially design algorithms to generate these summaries automatically alongside the existing metadata. Further on with Paul Groth and his team, we looked at data sense making practices. So once someone finds a data set that looks interesting, how do they go about understanding its content and deciding to use it?
We've also established in interview studies that data work is actually teamwork. And while previous studies have focused on individuals, actually a lot of data search happens in groups, in a team, rather than individually, perhaps different um, than classic information retrieval on the web. And that people ask others for help. The user experience for all that is very different. And as far as I know, there's very little research on, on, on that done yet. I would very much recommend you this um, article of Kathleen Gregory, Paul Groth and others, where they've asked over 3000 people to describe their experiences with data discovery, um, including um, the use of social channels um, and, 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 and related activities for this. If we think about the web of data and about publishing data online in a more user-centric way, we will have to see portals not so much as tools to discover data, but as content and community hubs that collocate documentation, stories, tools, reviews, and allowing users to engage with publishers and among each other. And the top right screenshot is from a company called Data World, a US-based company, which among others has this open community of data sharers and users, which are like very much in spirit and in design. And Kaggle is another example. Most of, uh, most of you might know it for competitions, but it is a platform where people share data and share tools to use with this data as well. And there's data-centric communities like Wikidata, OpenStreetMap, um, and for instance, this open research knowledge graph, which is also on the slide. That's work, by the way, by um, Sir an hour at Hanover, and they are building a community of collaborators, um, including incentives to collaborate. There was a call launched for this, which you may want to have uh, a look at. The benefits of getting the data ready for others to use can be substantial, especially when the data is created and maintained collaboratively, so efforts are, sp are, are, are spread out. As in the previous examples, incentives probably help as well. Several years ago, I had the chance to experience this. I led a program called the Open Data Incubator. This was funded through public European money, where we literally invested in startups and supported them to use any open data that could, they could find. And we've learned a lot about users' need, needs. We've also learned just how important it is to actually start with a problem that people care about, say affordable houses, housing in large urban areas, and then work your way to the data that is needed about how to publish it, how to ask, um, access it, and so on. Investments can play a huge role, and so do standards. And on the slide, I reference uh, open banking in the UK, um, which shows that when there is a need and there is a market, um, open open innovation, open approaches do make a difference. As a, a side note to this, um, so some years later, after the Open Data Incubator, I ran another similar program, and this time the focus was not on open data, but it was specifically on data that is commercial or otherwise sensitive that is shared only for the purpose of innovation and will never make it into the open domain. In the Open Data Incubator, this was 2016, startups' main reason to participate in the program was the equity free funding. In the follow on program, which was called data pitch, the main driver had been access to data, we would still invest 100,000 euros in each company. But the main reason for those companies to join was because they just couldn't find the data which they needed for the sort of AI products and services they were developing. So it does beg the question, which data sets should be opened or shared more widely to foster innovation with AI? I'm going to wrap up. So I believe our moment to reform the web of data is here. We're now in a much better position than 10 or 15 years ago. We know what's at stake. We have more evidence about how people use the web in data contexts. We also know um, how people publish data on the web. There's lots of other things that I haven't touched upon, and I've picked just three of them to, 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 to conclude. First, we need to think what's next in data documentation. There is enough evidence, including the studies um, I have done, about the link between documentation and use. 
What's next in data documentation? Well, that means metadata vocabularies and what they need to entail, but also how we could support publishers use identifiers and domain vocabularies more effectively. The studies we've run in text snippets for data and data sense making showed that existing vocabularies like DCAT and schema.org are still very limited in that respect. So if someone wants to use a data set they found online, based on the metadata that is captured in, 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 in those sort of records, they can't really do that with confidence. Fortunately, there's excellent work in the AI community, elsewhere in the AI community. Um, one common approach is called data sheets for data set. Um, there's also this data cards playbook project I would recommend. Um, if you want to have a sense of the additional information that would be needed, not just to find and index data, but actually to support data use. I still don't know what to say about links between data sets and where the business cases for links at large in an open decentralized scenario are. If it's about, you know, hop hopping from one information to another, I, I do get it. But to publish links independently of a use case or, or, or in other contexts, I'm still not very convinced. But if you have any ideas, I'd love to talk about it. Critical data is missing. So we've done some work on this in open data for rural areas. For instance, we've done a study for the European Commission and the results were dismal. The digital divide is more present than ever. The Open Data Directive, that is the law for public sector information in the EU, has commissioned studies to identify what they call high value data sets. So they include six categories of data, which are published here on, on, on the slide in the middle, um, and are meant to help public authorities focus efforts. But what will happen with the others? There was also a public consultation last year in Europe into data sets that need to be shared more widely to facilitate AI innovation beyond a handful of global players. Finally, a personal favorite of mine, other data modalities that we don't really talk about when we talk about web of data traditionally, and I'm talking about charts. And we've all looked at lots of charts online this past year. They're rarely linked to the actual data. Can we publish them in a different way to support actually fact checking and identify misleading representation? There's much more we could talk about, um, but ultimately I would like us as a community to think about all issues in a user-centric evidence-based way. And I think that's the only way for the web of data to deliver on its promise. I'd like to thank you for your attention and to thank my collaborators at Southampton, at King's College and at the University of Amsterdam, the Open Data Institute, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Elena. Uh, this was a very impressive overview of, of the whole scene. So, so yeah, let, let's get right to it. So, so let's open with Marco's question. Um, so he is asking, how do you see the role of Google's dataset search in this uh, uh, ecosystem? Yeah, thank you. Very, very, I wanted to say something about this and, and then I ran out of slides. Um, I think <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very interesting <laughs> question for several reasons. Um, so at least in government, there's been a lot of focus on on releasing the data, on training public authorities to publish the data in the right way with high quality metadata and so on and so forth. Um, and the use case behind it was always search. And then Google data set search happened. Um, now, the difference between the sort of technology and scale that Google have in doing search for data sets or in fact, any other types of ob objects does not compare with any sort of data publisher that is putting the data on the web. Um, so there is that unbalance there. But at the same time, there is there are also dependencies between Google that is providing a data set search tool, something like the European data portal, which harvests data sites and metadata records about different data sets over 80 different portals and the individual providers. So if I'm a publisher, if I'm a public authority in France and I have my data portal and I've put the data there, I would like to understand how my traffic on the site is impacted by Google Dataset Search, 
by the EDP and where I would need to invest to maximize this traffic. But all I'm talking is, is all this things that I'm talking about here are very much in the distant future because most publishers actually measure um, something like this very, very, um, uh, I mean, almost, almost never. And they also, there is a very limited understanding of how some, a metric like traffic um, does relate indeed to data set use. And the stuff that we've done with, with, with GitHub is sort of uh, meant to, to show how it could be done. Um, but I think there is a, there is lots of work still, still to be done there. Uh, so a further question for Marco. Uh, so okay. when talking about data, uh, dynamic, possibly real-time data is becoming a necessity for many applications. So are the existing data portals supporting that kind of dynamic data? Yes, yes, there are. Um, I haven't, I have to say, none of my studies looked specifically of IoT data, but there are portals. Um, so I, specifically, I am familiar and I've been involved in projects in mobility. Um, also some projects in the UK where public authorities are setting up new types of sensors um, and they publish um, um, they publish different feeds of data sets in, in a similar way. Um, so I guess an interesting question there would be um, about the user experience in that case, because it is different from, from static data sets. But yes, to answer the question shortly, there are various portals with, um, with um, dynamic uh, data sets. Perhaps to, to ask something myself in, in sort of the direction. Um, so as someone who has uh, worked with governments on data, or at least has tried to, um, uh, so in the context of the, of the situation that we cover right now with COVID, uh, what our experience uh, has been was that uh, when something happened, like we had a crisis, the data that was supposedly there simply wasn't or was not accessible in a format that could be used. Now, do you feel there's a case to be made? Maybe we can ride this wave and, and frame this as a uh, resilience uh, uh, issue. So there's a lot of talk of resilience now and perhaps forcing, I don't know, at least at some government level, stress tests for situations so that we say, okay, if we have a pandemic, if we have an economic crisis, something, um, can, do we have the data to bring us out of it? Yeah, yeah, very good question. I think obviously 2020 was an exceptional year for, for, for everyone. And um, one could argue that we should have been better prepared. But the other, uh, the, the other um, answer is that indeed this was, this was unprecedented, to use a loaded word. Um, however, the, the issue that you are addressing is, is quite common also in more pedestrian situations. And I, in my experience with publishers is that showing them that people need the data helps enormously. So there's very dedicated teams behind each portal in most situations, but they just don't know if anyone cares. Um, so there is a very interesting approach um, that um, uh, say the French open government data portal take, um, which is very much modeled around building a community of users and publishers where um, the focus is very much on, on, on engagement and interaction and, 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 and various parties can publish the, 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 the data. Um, but ultimately, most publishers just put the data out there and then they continue to do so because they know they have a key set of, of, of uh, domains they have to go through. Um, and they just love to have feedback. So knowing that your data set is used is the best um, you could you could give back to them. Um, and that does trigger um, you know, more motivation and more efforts to, to um, maintain that data and in fact, to continue the effort. So, so love is the answer, as in many cases. Well, love and and actually just 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 being able to show and to know and to find out uh, that the data is used. Mm -hmm. uh, so, going on. To, uh, so, what are uh, so a question from Ivan? Uh, what about the history of data? How easy it is to be able to look into the historical evolution of a given data set? Are we prepared for that? 
Um, yes, thank you for that, Ivan. Um, I think some portals there do a do a better job than others, um, but I still um, think that the focus in most cases is to release data sets that are not yet in the public domain rather than thinking about their evolution. For evolution, so, so in terms of, 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 of strategy, so there is a list of domains that uh, publishers go through. Um, they have different teams that that deal with that data, collecting it, curating it, and so on and so forth. And and even you know after you've published thirty thousand data sets in a in a in a big country, there is still data that is missing. Like I said, uh, data sets about about rural areas, complete disaster. Um, so evolution typically happens. Uh, driven by the same sort of vectors as what we were discussing before. So if you see that the data is really important, or perhaps now in the EU that we have legislation that says these six areas are crucial, um, then that would help focus the minds and the efforts and concentrating on those data sets. Um, but overall, I would say that the focus is still very much on, on, on just working down that list and making the data available. Uh, okay, great. Uh, so the next question will be from Roberta, who is asking if you know of any machine learning based approaches to link the data sets, for example, through automatic column matching, uh, or to generate documentation, and what are the challenges in that area? Right, okay, so so I am not an expert in, in, in interlinking, but there are um, approaches. There are approaches um, that, for instance, take tables or uh, spreadsheets um, and then try to annotate um, the headers in those data sets semantically and build links um, based on that information. There's also neural approaches to, to, um, to do that. So the answer is yes, but I'm not working specifically in that area. Um, so I can't um, give you specific pointers, I'm sorry. Um, the other question is to generate documentation. Um, so that's that's an area that 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 we're we're working on for data sets. I think the the trouble has so far has been that we just didn't have enough um, data to work on with machine learning. I mean, there are corpora like based on Wikipedia where you tap table as the info box and you have the text in the article which you could use perhaps for this purpose. But ultimately, what that one study has shown is that that sort of uh, training data would actually not be helpful because in that data summaries in that tech snippets um, uh, study we could show exactly what sort of information we would need to have in the summaries for them to be useful um, and that includes descriptive statistics um, that includes uh, the most important uh, columns or rows in the table that includes the temporal and spatial context so perhaps that that means that we could think about some sort of rule-based approach um, but still we would need to have a data set to, to use, and ours is openly available, um, but we're not yet at the stage to have the scale probably that is that is needed. But it's something that we're working on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, Albert is pointing out that uh, GitHub uses things like used by badges to, to point out uh, code reuse, um, and uh, sort of raising the issue that this would probably help with motivating people to share data. Um, I'm sort yeah. of gathering that, yeah. Yeah, so so that's a fantastic idea, and that's something that we are um, doing now. Um, there is a, there's we are now starting the third um, round of the European Data Portal. Um, over the next six years, the focus will be specifically on making publishing more user centric, and that's one uh, type of feature that we're explicitly thinking about. Um, I don't know about links. My my feeling is that we need to separate the different use cases a bit better. As I said in my talk, the um, that information browsing, search and browsing case is is very compelling, perhaps for cultural heritage, but it is not compelling for government where um, the data is used in a different way. People download the data set and write studies or um, use it in data science projects. And then 
the links are there, but ultimately the effort that people need to make to integrate data sets happens elsewhere, not on the web. Mm -hmm. So Raphael has pointed out that the French uh, data portal seems to yeah. be going in this direction already. Uh, yeah. we're, 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 we're slowly coming to a close, but still perhaps just with, to finish up, let's circle back to Marco, who has pointed out the, the wiki functions project, uh, uh, if you're aware of, aware of it. So the, this idea to build a Wikipedia of functions that would then be used to build new data from existing data. Um, yeah. How do you feel this ambition working? Yes. Um, so um, the um, the wiki function project is, is 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 super interesting. I my understanding. So for those who don't know what it is, it's basically one way to um, generate Wikipedia articles in under resourced languages programmatically. Um, and practically, imagine a function to translate from Fahrenheit to Celsius, uh, Celsius for temperature, um, or to um, perform arithmetic operations. I think this will help generating better text. Um, I don't know how it would be applied to structured data, to other modalities, but, but it's something that, that definitely it's worth looking into. Um, I think it would help really um, mostly with taking one text from one language and, and, and turning it into another one. Okay, great. Uh, so I think time-wise we need to close. Uh, this was a great talk. Thank you again, Elena. Okay. Um, and uh, hope to see you soon somewhere. Um, and uh, well, everyone have a great day at the conference and uh, see you later. There's two more keynotes today and a panel in the, in the afternoon, the European afternoon. So hope, hopefully see you there. Goodbye. Thank you.